announcement before the uh, children's sermon. Um, every uh, December, we take up a, a special offering for our foreign missionaries. It's called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. 100% of this offering goes to the missionaries themselves, and nothing is, is held back for administrative costs. It is one of the most important offerings that we take all year long because the missionaries depend on it. If you were uh, called to serve in a foreign country, you would want to know that you were taken care of by those back at home. So what I suggest is, now as you know, we're not passing an offering plate. We've got the boxes as Lindy expressed, and we've got boxes back in the foyer. If you make the check out to the church, and then put uh, Lottie Moon Christmas Offering, or you can just put Moon, you can remember that, Moon Christmas Offering, or just Moon. And then, or you can go online, and that's one of the choices that you can give to. So, um, okay, uh, <clears throat> oh, and how much? A lot of folks ask me, well, how much? All I know is that for years, what I've done is I've included Lottie Moon as like part of my family. So I give a gift to Lottie Moon Christmas offering, equivalent to what I would give to one of my kids for Christmas. So that's just a, a guide that I use. Uh, children, boys and girls, come on down for the children's sermon. Don't they look beautiful and handsome? Well, good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, Pastor Joe. I'm so glad that you're here. When you, uh, most all of you are already in elementary school or preschool, right? Okay. And have you learned how to read an old-fashioned clock that has an hour hand and a minute hand or wait yes hour hand and minute hand yes a clock a clock have y'all learned how to read a clock an old-fashioned one yeah sort of okay so yeah. if it's three o'clock where will the yes the minute hand would be on the on the on the at the very um on the three no, the minute hand would be on the 12, and the hour hand would be on the 3. Excellent. That's very good. You see, this, this is something that we're not learning as much anymore because our world is kind of going away from the old-fashioned. So if I were to tell you that you should turn something clockwise, what would that mean? Do you know? You'd have to turn it in the way that the clock goes. You are so smart. You must be homeschooled, right? Yeah, I, okay, I just... <laughs> <clears throat> so, <clears throat> no offense to public school. I love public school, too. So, um, if you were a marching band and, and you were to being told to go clockwise, some folks today that only know what digital clocks do, they might go flip, 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 <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's old-fashioned, old too. Okay, so... Um, a lot, you know what this is called? No, that's a watch. What kind of watch? A wrist watch. Right, that's right, a, wi a, a whist watch. Okay. <laughs> it's so it can whist by your, uh, where is Lindy when I need her? You know, so <clears throat> this is called a wrist watch, and the big one on the wall is called a clock. How do most people know what time it is these days? How? Because then... How do they find out what time it is? What do they do? For all of the grown-ups. Put your your dress down. For all of the grown-ups, when they just when they say, "What time is it?" Okay, it's that time. Yeah, the old folks they they look at their watch, but most younger folks, what do they look at? Their phone. Their phone, yes. And you know, it used to be that all the if 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 one person had a clock you knew what time it was. But if two people had a clock, you never really knew what time it was because they were always a little bit different. But now that they are standardized by the certain amount of time on this earth, 
but you invite us, Father, to spend forever with you, and that's what we want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all can go to Children's Church. Good morning. We're so happy to see you all here today, and now we ask that you will please stand and join us in worship.
Thank you, praise team. Thank you, YVET. Good morning. Before I engage you too much, uh, I want to ask you um, a few questions. And you, remember that just pretend you're back in high school and you're about ready to take a little English quiz. Um, what do you call? A group, I'm going to start off easy. What do you call a group of birds? Good job. I'm so proud of y'all. What do you call a group of geese? That's usually a sound we make when we hear someone on television saying something terrible. <laughs> what do you call a group of ducks that's not in the air but on the water? 
ducklings. Those are the baby ones. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. Now, what do you, what are the whole group of ducks, not just the baby ones? Targets. <laughs> Targets. Dinner, right? Yeah. Um, come on. A group of ducks on the water is called a raft, R-A-F-T. What do you call a group of lions? Good job, okay. What do you call a group of pigs? <laughs> Trouble, yeah. Piglets, yeah. A drift, D-R-I-F-T. What do you call a group of fish? What do you call a group of students? A class. What do you call a group of horses? Either a herd or a band, B-A-N-D. What do you call a group of bees? A swarm. What do you call a group of angels? A host. Amen. That's right. What do you call a group of giraffes? A tower. Isn't that a good name? It's a muster of peacocks. You call a group of professors a faculty. You call a group of performers a troop. You call a group of coconuts a cluster. You call a group of actors a company. A group of badgers are a colony. What do you call a group of politicians. Be nice. Be nice. I'm sure you don't know this one, so I'll tell you. Equivocation. Now that, let me read you the definition of equivocation. The use of ambiguous language to conceal the truth or to avoid committing oneself. That's pretty good. I, I think that's pretty good. Now, <clears throat> you call a group of apes, there is a more official, formal name, and then there is the colloquial name. The group of apes, formally, is called a troop, but colloquially, it's called Congress. You got it. All right. <laughs> so, um, now, I'm going to ask you... I'm going to ask you a question that if you get it without checking your smartphone while we're talking, I'll buy you lunch. I'll buy you a steak. Probably a tube steak at uh, one of the fast foods restaurants. But here we go. What do you call a group of magpies? Now, now before you jump in there, a, a very powerful light is called a mag light, right? You've heard of that. Um, if you donate a bunch of pies to the Nimitz staff, that's called a mag... Okay, but what do you call a group of magpies? What? A murder? Okay, now you're real close because a murder is a group of crows, and a magpie is part of the crow family. But there is a special name for a group of magpies. I think I just got out of buying anybody lunch. So are you all ready? <laughs> Tidings. T-I-D-I-N-G-S. A group of magpies. So, <clears throat> behold, I bring you Glad tidings, and that does not mean magpies. But if you're reading the King James translation of the Bible of the Christmas story, when, um, when the shepherds were out in the field in Luke chapter 2, it says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, they were greatly afraid. King James says, sorely afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day 
in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. The announcement of the host of angels to the shepherds. Behold, I bring you great or good tidings, which you know in the New American Standard or the Living Bible or the NIV is I bring you good news. So tidings in the King James is more commonly known as news. I bring you good news. When I was in high school, somebody gave me a translation of the Bible, which was translated so that a sixth grade, someone on the sixth grade education level could understand it. It was called good news for modern man. And so good news is what the angel said. Now in Luke 1, the angel of the Lord appeared to Zacharias and standing at the right side of the altar of incense, when Zechariah saw this angel, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God. He will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So Zechariah then asked the angel, well, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is no spring chicken. <laughs> That's the Joe Taylor paraphrase right there. And the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Read it with me. And I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Great tidings, good news. I want to ask you this morning, is the message of Jesus really good news? Well, you and I would be very quick to say absolutely, but let me, let me just park on this for just a moment. In the Old Testament, when God showed up and told Moses, I'm going to use you to bring the people out of bondage, out of Egypt, that was good news because God had heard the prayers of the people, God's people, who were in bondage in Egypt. But was it good news to Pharaoh and the Egyptians? No. Was it good news to everybody else in the world? No. But it was good news to Moses and to the Israelites, to the Jewish people, the family of God. It absolutely was good news to them. Now, I want to go back and read one more time what the angel said to the shepherds. He says, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all the people. So it's not just for the Israelites. It's not just those who were held in captivity in Egypt. This good news is for all of us. So the angel coined this term, good news. Well, in Luke chapter 8, the Bible says, after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, read it with me, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him, the 12 disciples, two and also some women had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. And then Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Do you think that Jesus and his message was good news to the women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases? Absolutely. 
But I can tell you the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees did not look at Jesus as good news. They called him a troublemaker. He was turning things upside down. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, it says that after John was put into prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 1, he puts it this way. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Read it aloud with me. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel... A righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from the first to the last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So the Apostle Paul called the good news the gospel. Spell it with me, G-O-S-P-E-L. What does gospel mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because the word gospel actually comes from the old English word, good spell. So if I were to say, let's sit for a spell, that means a time frame. But there's another definition for the word spell, S-P-E-L, and it means a story or a message or some news. And gut, although it looks like God, in the old English, it meant good, and God is good. So the good spell means the good news. So you have your Bible, and most often in some of the newer translations, the first four books of the New Testament says Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But most of the older translations label it just a little different. They call it the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Mark. In fact, if today, if you were to ask me something and I'm telling you something that you're not sure I'm telling you the truth, I might say, I promise it's the gospel truth. Because if you know the gospel, you know it's the truth. And if you compare truth with the good news, sometimes good news is just hard to believe. In fact, you can go on the internet and do some searches and they'll say something on the internet on the page or the Facebook or this or that and it'll capture your attention and it sounds like good news. But sometimes it's too good to be true. And you wonder, could this be true? Can you imagine if on all of the internet sites tomorrow morning it said, good news. Science has just discovered that processed sugar is good for you and will extend your life another 10 or 15 years. Woo! That's good news. But we know that's not true news. And so we're living in a day and time when we hear good news. And anytime you hear some really good news, don't you want it to be true? You lean into it. You want it. And so when the angel said, good news, we want this to be true. I remember hearing a story about a, a children's Christmas musical, which we're going to have. And in this children's Christmas musical, there was one little, little boy that loved to play outside. He wasn't very good at memorizing lines, and he was made to to wear a halo and some wings and it just didn't fit and then he had some lines he had to memorize and he worked on it and he worked on it and he memorized and he memorized and he was supposed to say behold I bring you glad tidings and when he had his part and everybody was waiting and he steps out and he saw how big the congregation looked he went blank 
Everybody was trying to help him along. And finally, he just said, well, I've got some great news for y'all. Which means, is it good news for you? Well, good news is only good for those who receive it. And you got to know in our day and time, not everybody receives the good news. Well, the word gospel is the root word for good news. But I want to show you another word. And before I jump to the word itself, I'm going to read Acts 21 and then 2 Timothy. Acts 21 says, verse 7 and 9, we continue, this is the Apostle Paul talking about his journey. And he says, we continued our voyage from Tyre, landed at Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist. You know what an evangelist is? Maybe you do. Let's look at the next passage, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, But you, Timothy, keep your head in all situations. The New American Standard says, be sober. King James says, keep a watch. I think John the Baptist probably likes the NIV. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. What is an evangelist? I'm glad you asked. Evangelist comes from the Greek word eangelion, which is a noun which means good news. So the gospel is good news, and euangelion means good news. In the English, we transliterate the U to be a V. So evangelion means good news, but if you're bringing or announcing good news, it's euangelizo, the verb, and I'm just going to jump to the back to the last. Eangeliu means an evangelist. But look right there in the middle of the word evangelia or evangelist is the word angelos, which means a messenger. So an angel, a messenger, is in the middle of good news. So a lot of folks have no idea that so many of our English current words today are derived from the Bible itself and words that God chose. Let me tell you a story here about Mark 2. You know this story or this account. In Mark 2, verse 1, it says this. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. After digging through it, they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I bet you that paralytic was thinking, well, that's not why I came. I came to get healed. But let me ask you a question. Do you remember in your Bible teachings what people of that day believed caused so many people to be paralyzed are sick. Sin. So when the man is lowered, the first thing that Jesus does is not address his need for physical healing. But the very first thing he does is he says, brother, your sins are forgiven. Now notice what the teachers of the law and the scribes and the Pharisees react. Some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. 
Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And so he spoke to them and he said, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to do what I just said, forgive sins. Then he now turns to the paralytic and he says, get up, take up your mat and go home. You see, if he had healed him first, they would have never said, only God can forgive sins and this man is blaspheming. He laid a foundation. Jesus is so wise. He laid a foundation first and he says, I forgive you of your sins. And they said, well, nobody can do that but God. Don't you know Jesus just smiled? And then he said, so that you will know that I have the authority I say to you, get up and walk. And the man gets up and walks. He got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this before. Once again, Jesus went on beside the lake. This is just the next passage. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. So let me ask you a question again. Was it good news for the paralytic, absolutely. Was it good news for the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the Sadducees? They didn't think so because Jesus was turning everything upside down for them. What about Levi, the tax collector? Nobody likes tax collectors. In fact, they were considered so far gone, there was no place in heaven for them. And Jesus looked at Levi or Matthew and said, you come follow me. Was that good news for him? Absolutely. But was it good news for the religious group that wanted to keep everything the same? They didn't think so. So I'm saying to you this morning that even though the angel said, I've got some good news for you, and this good news is for everyone, not everyone receives the good news. I wonder why. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he said, I tell you the truth, nobody can see the kingdom of God. No one can even see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Is that good news? Well, it's good news if you're born again. It's not good news if you're not. How can a man be born again when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, no, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water. That would be the physical birth and the spirit, the spiritual birth. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. So I tell you that unless you have been born by the Spirit, unless you have been born again by God, it's not good news unless you receive Jesus. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son. You and I have memorized it, the old King James gave his only what? Begotten son. That whosoever or whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? 
For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. That's good news. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the God's one and only Son. That's not good news. So this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. Light. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. My pastor, Buckner Fanning, growing up, he used to say, I understand why children are afraid of the dark, but I can't understand why adults are afraid of the light. Jesus answered in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Is that good news? Yes. Well, it's good news if you go to the Father through Jesus. But there are a lot of folks today that say, well, that's pretty narrow-minded. There are a lot of ways to go to God. Can you imagine if you were one of the ones in the Twin Towers on 9-11 when the towers were hit and on fire and you were trapped by fire somewhere up on the top of one of those towers. Can you imagine seeing a fireman with an axe bust through a wall and reach out his hand to you and say, follow me. And you say, well, I'm sure there are a lot of ways that I can get out of here. You're just one of many. You would be foolish not to reach out your hand and take the one who has risked his life to come and rescue you. In the same way, we would be foolish if we rejected Jesus who gave his life to rescue us. Would we not? One last passage. Isaiah 5.20 says this. Read it with me. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Oh, church family, I want you to capture this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. It was just yesterday, it seemed, when our culture started calling evil good. It's not so bad. Everybody else is doing it. Evil is not so bad. It's not, in fact, everyone can choose their own good and everyone can decide for themselves their own truth. It was just yesterday that our culture was calling evil good. But now, we have just entered where our culture is calling good evil. Now, let me explain. It was just yesterday that they were saying, sin's not so bad. But today, they're saying good is evil. They are destroying the foundations of marriage. They are confusing the identity of our young people. And now they are trying to tear down everything that is good, and they're calling good evil. And if you believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, you are going to be called evil. And they will pass laws to prevent you doing the good news and following Jesus. And never, never should you proclaim the good news gospel of Jesus Christ because they are saying it's evil. Now, if you happen to think that Christianity in some way or fashion is no longer good, then you've heard the wrong good news because there is nothing like the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ 
wanted you to be a part of his kingdom so badly that he gave it all. And when the angel Gabriel, when he shows up and he says, boy, have I got some good news for you. He didn't say, God has decided to reduce the Ten Commandments to five and you just choose which ones. The angel didn't say, I've got some good news for you. It's not going to be that bad anymore without God. Everything's going to be okay. No. What the angel said is, I've got good news. The good news is, even though you're a sinner, God has provided a Savior. He loves you so much that our loving God has given to you this day a Savior. And Jesus looked at the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Luke chapter 16, verse 16. And when he was being criticized for preaching the good news, he responded by saying this, the law and the prophets were valid until John. But now the good news of the kingdom of God is what we are preaching and proclaiming. And then he said this, and everyone is trying to get in on it unless you hate the light. This Christmas, I pray, I hope that God's people will declare from the mountaintops the good news that he has sent Jesus to deliver us from sin. Would you bow your heads? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, it's still good news for me. It's good news for those of us who have gathered in this place as a congregation to worship you and exalt your name. Father, it's still good news because we know that there is no other name given among men by which anyone could be delivered from their bondage of sin other than your name, the name of Jesus. And Father, this name, this name is the name that we shout from the mountaintops even when the world of darkness holds their hands over their ears. Because this name brings hope. Your name brings salvation. The old passes away and all things become new. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Jesus. And the people said. Amen. We're going to have prayer warriors, prayer partners around the back wall. If you would like to pray, if you have never said yes to Jesus being your Lord, what are you waiting on? It's good news. You can pray with one of those prayer partners. Let's stand and let's worship our mighty God.
Thank you all very, very much. Wasn't that good? Uh, okay, I got to tell you two more um, compound nouns. A group of plumbers is called a flush. That's true. But here's one that I, I, I like. A group of eagles is called a, that's in the air, but they're also called a congregation. You are a group of eagles, and I love you, and I appreciate you. We will have our children's musical next Sunday. Um, I will preach at the end, so they've got the first half of the service. I've got the second half of the service. And then the next Sunday, we will have what we call our, our home uh, home style Christmas. It'll be Christmas in the round. We'll have uh, uh, hot chocolate and wassail and hot coffee, and we're going to have a great celebration. Santa and his wife are going to be here for the kids, so uh, it's going to be great. It will be at the same time, 1045, and we'll also have a candle lighting, so I hope you can join us for Christmas. Let's pray. Lord, what can we say other than thank you for the good news of Jesus? We receive him. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.